going on everyone john matrix here hope you're all having yourselves a wonderful day uh we're gonna be jumping in here with some 40k stuff today we're gonna be checking out uh the fall of damnos 40k lore and lore and story uh by the scholars lore so uh links will be down below in the description to the original video without my commentary and reaction and to scholars lore channel do me a favor click those links uh if you enjoy this uh, original video of his give it a like Go over there and check out his channel if you enjoy his content. Makes a lot of great content for the 40k universe. So please do me a favor. Give the man a sub if you enjoy his stuff. He definitely deserves it. Uh, we're doing this reaction live for my YouTube members. So if you would uh, like to come in, join the discussions that we have as we're doing these reactions live. We'd love to have you guys come in here, hang out, you know, join the discussions, give your two cents, speculations, theories, etc. on the videos. Uh, there is a join button down below the video as well as a uh, link down in the description to the YouTube membership benefit tiers. Uh, if you do me a favor, take a look at them, see if any of them have any interest for you. If you decide you would like to take your support to the next level and help me out monetarily, it allows me to focus more on doing these YouTube videos and getting more content out for you guys on a regular basis. So I greatly appreciate it. Regardless of that, I just appreciate you guys taking the time out of your busy days to watch these videos. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. So, shameless plugs done. We're going to get into the video here. Uh, have you seen the new trailer for the uh gabriel uh no i haven't i haven't seen it i have not sir you can link it to me in discord if you want to and i can take a look at it but for now we're going to get into this video here so again this is the fall of damnos 40k lore and story by the scholars lore deep within the eastern fringe of segmentum ultima we will find the world of damnos this icy, cold, frigid hunk of rock was colonized for the glory of the Imperium of Man during the fabled days of the Great Crusade. The sheer abundance of raw resources on this planet made it a perfect contender for a mining world. Its bounty would be harvested, refined, and sent off to the farthest reaches of the galaxy, mm. all to fuel the ravenous war machine of the Imperium by sustaining the ever-burning furnaces of the most distant Forge worlds. Due to this planet being situated in a relatively peaceful area of space, with the chance of a conflict occurring here being rather low, the High Lords of Terra mm. did not provision Damnos with a significant military presence. Their barracks of... That could obviously make it a juicy target, but still. ...and watchtowers were manned by a small contingent of Astra Militarum forces who were assigned to act as the planetary defense force and nothing more. The civilians who lived and died here would toil away their days for the glory of the Emperor, where they would endure the sharp, frozen winds of Damnos, only being able to take some meager pleasure in the knowledge that they were serving the greater Imperium. I don't know why, but I uh, can't remember the name of the, the Klingon moon that has the, the lithium mine on it or whatever from... Star Trek six that that's also gone on to other things, but give me vibes of that or, you know, Kirk and them were sent there to uh, mine the the uh, the crystals or whatever for their starship factories. But it's, it's giving me those kind of vibes. But whilst the unfortunate dregs of humanity worked, quarreled and died upon the icy surface, there was an unknown threat slumbering deep beneath their glaciers. This enemy was simply waiting in a state mm. of hibernation, and with a simple signal, they would reawaken the Necrons, and end huh? their long aeons of slumber to reclaim their yep. world. This threat, however, Interesting. was to be activated by an unfortunate series of events at the hands of a curious Mechanicus expedition oh, force. Rip. I think I've like heard a little bit about this. Then I do seem to remember something about this before, where. Uh, a Mechanicus dude was like studying something and accidentally like triggered the awakening of these Necrons prematurely and then oops it kind of wiped everyone out anyway. The planet of Damnos was primarily powered by a series of immense geothermic power stations which could harness and mobilize the huge amounts of energy produced by the tectonic movements beneath the planet's surface Many of oh, okay. these geothermal plants were situated on the northern pole of this world, close to the densely populated city of Mandus Prime. Unfortunately for its denizens, however, 
a series of unprecedented earthquakes shook through their city, leading to many of the power plants shutting down due to large-scale structural damage. With rolling blackouts bringing their industries to a screeching halt. That would be a problem. The governors promptly requested for a team of Mechanicus tech priests to be dispatched to Damnos with haste. In accordance with the ancient Treaty of Mars... You know, you would think in general that they would just have some station there anyway to help, you know, maintain these. Like, if this world um, had someone of an importance in production of certain things, uh, you know, and are ran off of, you know, these various power stations like this, you would think that they would just have some mechanics there stationed in general anyway to help, you know, maintain and monitor these things. But that's just me. You know, the Imperium doesn't work at all the way. I would think it should. A Mechanicus team was sent to mine through the ice sheets, where they sought to locate the source of this damage and to repair any crippled components they could. Whilst blasting through the thick layers of frozen earth, several of the accompanying servo skulls began to emit vast liturgical scripts of binary to their tech priests, informing mm. them of an abnormality below the ice. The Mechanicus group paused in their rather brutish mining methods and instead began to carefully excavate the cavern. And it is here that they found something truly remarkable. Close to where the geothermic station was located, they discovered a set of ancient ruins constructed out of an unknown black metal jutting rather starkly out of the blue ice. Wouldn't they... Wouldn't it be, like, technically, I guess, illegal for them to, like, even study this shit, though? Because, obviously, this looks like it's some kind of, like, alien tech, right? I guess maybe it would it could be inert to the point where they might not necessarily see it as technology. But still, like, yeah, it has, like, alien writing on it. So wouldn't they necessarily not want to study it for fear of... Yeah, this is alien stuff that's influencing us, right? You know what I mean? The pillars and obelisks around this structure were indented by faintly glowing green runes and symbols, with their meaning being completely unknown to the science of Mars. In an instant, the tech priests ceased in their efforts to restart the power plant, and instead claimed the entire excavation site for the Adeptus Mechanicus. It seems to be the case, They sent yeah. a relay message to the planetary governors that they were required to investigate and study the newly uncovered structure and that Damnos would simply have to wait until they had completed their research, until further efforts could be made to restart their geothermal stations. The Imperial aristocrats replied with a furious barrage of colorful Gothic text within their data messages but the priests did not even bother to check their contents, as their new discovery deserved their utmost and undivided attention. Due to the Mechanicus forces only consisting of a small squad who did not have the required tools or equipment for a full excavation, they knew that they could only retrieve a select few artifacts and samples, and that a full expedition would be required to fully survey this site. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, they retreated to the... Wouldn't they, again, I don't know. I guess it would depend on the tech priests there, exact, you know, as well. You would think that they would report this to their superiors, and the superiors would want to send more people out. To, like, study this and, and excavate it more thoroughly, while also sending another group out to, I guess, help them get the production stuff going on Damnos as well, right? Because that still needs to be done, too. Anyway the nearby forge world of Goethe Majoris to begin their in-depth analysis on their prized treasures, as well as to organize a future visit by a fully equipped exploratory fleet. Mere days after their ship departed, the northern pole of Damnos was racked by a series of terrible atmospheric storms which cut off all contact the citizens of Mandos Prime once held with the rest of the world. Rep. Vast occlusive storm clouds soon spread out to envelop the surrounding region, with small communities reporting that bolts of green lightning were sporadically bursting out from the skies, leaving small pools of melted ice where they landed. 
Imperial Meteorological Station simply assumed this to be a freak atmospheric disturbance. Yeah, freak. It's, but unfortunately, know, this storm was in fact a dark forewarning of a calamity which was soon to befall all of Damnos. Far I mean, I guess, like, on, on one hand, like, how vast the Imperium is, right? I could understand them being like, eh, whatever. This shit happens all the time. It's just some bad weather. But at the same time, how many times have they said that and then it turns out to be something serious? You know what I mean? Far beneath the ice, the forgotten ruins had begun to stir. Energetic pylons hummed into activity once more, and vast crypt complexes shuddered and moaned as their doors lurched open. Whilst under the cover of the storm, the first of the Necrons marched forth from their ancient tombs, walking upon the cold grounds of their world for the first time in over 60 million years. Phalanx after phalanx silently filed out with a grim sense of direction, with huge groupings moving towards each of the major city centers and industrial zones solely with the goal of exterminating all biological life. As the Necron forces advanced, the mysterious shroud above the northern pole rapidly expanded until it was occluding the entire northern hemisphere of Damnos. Damn. Any Imperial Defense Forces caught under the oppressive clouds would have no way of contacting other Militarum yeah. outposts for aid, and so they would be forced to face off against the coming onslaught with whatever meager equipment they were stationed with. I was going to say, uh, it must be some kind of uh, weapon they're using to break off communication and or also, you know, great weather anomaly effects that are hazards to, you know, humans as well. It is of no wonder then that as the Necrons descended upon defense complexes that they utterly and remorselessly wiped out any human life which was encountered. Yeah. The weak cracks of Lasgun. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, he, he, was just, he was about to say Lasguns. It's like, yeah, what, what are, what are Lasguns really going to do against you know, some Necrons, dude? Gunfire was shrugged off by the hulking living metal frames of the Necron warriors who would respond with blinding waves of energy emitted from their ancient gorse flares. Any caught by the sparkling green bolts were disassembled at a molecular level, with their bodies falling to naught but stray atoms. You know, at least you would think getting hit by one of those things would be painless, right? Because if you're deatomized, like literally from like a subatomic level, if you're just broken apart like instantly, you wouldn't have time to feel anything. You just not exist anymore. So at least there's that. Uh, the Imperium is like a giant wounded Hydra, easy to deal uh, when dealing with one of its heads alone. But uh, that's it until all the heads of Hydra. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. You know, the Necrons are essentially the first like humanoid race, right? I mean, there's there were the old ones in the Catan. Like, really, the Necrons were, like, the first, I guess, non-godlike race in the 40k universe, as far as we know, at the moment. You know, that could be retconned if they add a new uh, a faction at some point in time, but... Lost amongst the falling snow. It does make me wonder if at some point in time some more of the Warhammer fantasy factions they're going to somehow add into 40k, you know, like... Lizard men, are they going to add like lizard men somehow in as some kind of other, you know, advanced race in 40k and like mutate and change them in some way? I, weren't the Skaven somehow in 40k at some point, but they got like wiped out? Weren't they like a minor faction at some point in 40k, but then got wiped out? I, I thought I remember reading that somewhere at some point in time. Uh, its size is great, thing, but also it's great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's size is its greatest strength because when you can actually unite humanity under one cause, it's a force that's is very hard to be reckoned with. But uh, yeah, the other thing is, is when we're fractured and divided and not working together, it's the oldest trick in the book, divide and conquer, you know? Slowly and methodically, the Necrons continued in their endless march. Settlements, mining complexes, and entire cities yeah, it's true. And I mean, I don't know. I still think they could make them in some kind of way. I just don't know how well they would fit 
in 40k. You know what I mean? And I mean, they already kind of have ogres, like ogres, ogren. They're part of the Imperium. They're kind of a sub-faction race of the Imperium. So I, I don't see them really adding that. I don't know. They could add, like, the Beastmen in in some way. Um, I don't know what they would really do with them. You know, how they would add the Beastmen in. Um, vampires, I mean, they already kind of have, like, you know, the Night Lords and... I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know how they would add some of these other factions into the 40k universe. But it wouldn't surprise me if they do and try at some point in time. Cities appeared methodically. The Necrons continued in their endless march. Settlements, oh, okay, mining gotcha. complexes, and entire cities appeared to go dark across the entire planet, as if a silencing wave was spreading down throughout the world. The Imperial Signals agents upon the hive city of Damnos Secundus had noticed this concerning pattern, and in response, they ordered the rapid dispatch of light reconnaissance vessels to investigate the cause of this sudden lack of communication. Their rationale was that a simple storm should not be causing a complete dope. loss of contact with the rest of the world. It'd be cool to see some kind of like... Um... Like you're saying, they're like Eldar's kind of like a, a, a sub faction of Eldar that like brings like the Lizardmen and Eldar together and, and, and kind of expands on that. Like you said, you know, Eldar riding dinosaurs, a more kind of like primal primitive Eldar uh, sub faction that ties in a lot of stuff. That would be pretty dope, you know, riding Triceratopses and T Rexes and, and shit like that. Who wouldn't want that? You know, that'd be pretty, that'd be pretty fucking cool. However, if only these poor Imperials knew of the true horror which marched beneath the clouds, perhaps they would have sought to flee the world rather than commit to a doomed investigation. By this point, the abyssal comm shroud had covered nearly the entire planet, and beneath it, the living metal legions of Necrons had extinguished all life they had encountered. Warriors advanced and eliminated whatever fleeing dregs of humanity could be found through the abandoned mm. settlements, leaving not even their bones to be discovered. Some terrified workers cowered deep within the mines, but these lost souls were soon found by the burrowing tomb spiders and scarab yep. swarms who fell upon their victims with a cold and calculated execution. Even the heavily armored defensive bunkers were of no match to the advancing hordes. Groups of flayed ones seemingly materialized through the very walls, where they ravenously and brutally eviscerated any who were unfortunate enough to be trapped with them. I mean, they just didn't really have the weaponry to fight back, right? Like, really, what are, well, again, what are, what are basic las guns really going to be able to do against Necron? And even if you do happen to damage one, they're just going to, like, repair and come back, right? Like... Your only hope would be to, I guess, try to take one of their weapons from them and use it against them. But I would have a feeling that Necron technology would have fail safes that would prevent that. You know, if like you're a Necron and you try to use a Necron weapon, if you're not a Necron, I should say, and you try to use a Necron weapon, it'll probably like vaporize you. It has like some kind of like Judge Dread fail safe on it, I would assume. The small contingents of Imperial armor stationed upon Damnos were reduced to piles of glowing slag by the combined gorse weaponry of the floating destroyers. These groups would skim across the ice where they were eager to find any offensive sources of life to extinguish, desperately hoping that it would bring their scrambled and deteriorated minds some peace. As the war zone crept ever southwards, groups of fleeing Imperial forces had managed to make their way to the capital city of Kellenport, where they relayed the horrifying truth to their commanding officers. The planetary governor, with a heavy heart, acknowledged that their world was in a truly dire situation, and that if they continued on with their current strategy, that they may not even live to see the downfall of their home. As such, every single possible Imperial Guard force upon Damnos was mobilized and ordered to converge upon Kellenport, where they would make their final stand against the undying legions of the Necrons. 
As a final defensive strategy, the Imperial battleship known as the Nobilis had been stationed in low orbit above Kellenport, and its crew had been instructed to aim their mighty guns towards the surrounding regions of the city, in the hopes that they could obliterate any advancing Necrons who would soon arrive within its outskirts. I would assume that the Necrons would have technology to deal with this, though. This strategy was likely not going to be enough to halt the encroaching forces. Thankfully, the occlusive comm shroud had not yet covered the astropathic temples within the capital, and so a desperate call for aid was sent out through the stars, with the hopes that any Imperial forces may heed their message and come to their rescue. Only one fleet heeded this call, but in the Emperor's mercy, it was the strike cruisers of the Ultramarine Second Company who would respond, and their ships okay. made ready for transit towards the doomed world. As the fated final battle approached, the planetary governor and his closest advisors <laughs> retreated into a Proteus-class command bunker deep within the buried defensive complexes under Kellenport. Here they sought to direct and oversee the defensive operations of their city whilst enclosed within the assumed safety of a hefty ceramite wall. It was during this time of planning their final defensive strategy that the Imperial commanders thought that they had identified the leader of the Necron forces. Scattered reports from fleeing guardsmen had described an imposing figure marching at the head of the phalanxes who wielded a vast ornate scepter which would beam down ephemeral light to slice through the Imperial forces. Damn. Furthermore, all accounts described the Lord as holding a strange, impossibly dark orb, which could be thrust into the ground only to cause any destroyed Necrons to rebuild themselves and shuffle back into formation with the rest of their undying kin. Yeah. They had named this figure as the Voidbringer, and so his description was provided to the Imperial defenders in the hopes that they may be able to destroy this commanding figure and presumably bring a halt to the Necrons' inevitable advance. This may have seemed to be the logical plan. However, unbeknownst to the flailing and panicked Imperial commanders, the Voidbringer was not actually the overarching ruler of this world. The Lord was simply a subordinate to a far more ancient and powerful Phaeron, who was already marching his way to Kellenport. After a short week of frantically orchestrating the defenders into suitable positions, the Imperial commanders found themselves out of time, and the enemy was finally at their gates. The relentless march of the Necrons had finally reached the capital hive city of Kellenport, and their terrible assault began with earnest fury. Towering monoliths materialized all around the outskirts of the city, which opened up to reveal small gateways from which small squads of Necron warriors could march out from. I really don't have kind of an opinion one way or the other of the Ultramarines. I mean, they're kind of like the baseline of Astartes, right? They're like the most basic faction that every other faction seems to kind of be based off of. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't really have like a negative or positive opinion about them. Their gigantic <clears throat> crystalline core. Is there a group of Astartes, though? Is there a specific chapter that is like specializes in hunting down Necrons? That's something that I haven't really like come across yet in everything that we've gone through. Those would hum and whine as they charged up before unleashing their cataclysmic particle whips into the city walls. The ear splitting discharge from these weapons would leave immense craters and gaping wounds in the large defensive structures, with the air itself being singed by the trail of gotcha. antimatter particles fired from the monolith. Nevertheless, the yeah, I just didn't know if there was one that like specifically specialized in Necrons themselves. That were wherever the Necrons went, they tried to hunt them down, as opposed to just like generalize any kind of uh, Xenos. They're there to like kill them. The Imperials had brought their full armaments to bear in order to... Kind of like how the Grey Knights are, like, specialized in killing and hunting down demons. I was wondering if there was something, like, specific for Necrons, and then also another chapter that was specific for, like, Tyranids, etc. Different parts of the Death Watch? Okay. 
So yeah, there's different chapters of the Death Watch that specialize in different things. Gotcha. Okay. The defense vehicles fired from the monolith. Nevertheless, the Imperials had brought their full armaments to bear in order to defend themselves. The mighty battleship Nobilis fired salvo after salvo of melter torpedoes and heavy ordnance down into the Necron lines, reducing many of the monoliths to hulks of molten, sparking scrap. Similarly, the large defensive batteries from the Basilisk artillery units, Lehman Russ, battle tanks, and even the heavy weapon encampments were incredibly effective against the tides of Necron warriors. Huge swathes of the living metal constructs were brought low. Being utterly devastated beyond repair by the thunderous fire of the Imperial Guard. Yeah, I guess scorched earth tactics still work in the 41st uh, millennium, huh? Just bombard the shit out of them with as much artillery as you can until they die. Unfortunately, however, their triumphs were rather short-lived. Deep beneath the occlusive shroud, the Necrons had erected some of their heavier and stronger technological weapons, namely their terrible pylons. Several of these units aimed in unison towards the heavens, and I with a deafening blast, they emitted a titanic beam of green lightning into the skies. This energy pulse yeah. arced and pierced its way through the... Yeah, yeah, the, the general strategy of the Imperial Guard is meat shields up front, and then let the artillery just blow the shit out of everything. The atmosphere where it eventually struck with the Nobilis. From its impact site, the Necron energy sparked and twisted their way through the ship until it eventually exploded in a blinding burst of light. Yeah, I figured as much they Huge would have anti-ship weapons. The ship rained down upon Damnus, where they burned and spiraled down into the Imperial defensive lines, leading to entire areas of the Hive City being demolished by the horrific rain of fire. This proved to be too great of a moral defeat for some guardsmen, who saw this as a sign of their own <laughs> impending what? doom. This guy is like, nope, I'm out. This man is out. And so some chose to meet the Emperor by their own hands. By this point, the phalanxes of Necron warriors were already marching through the streets of Kellenport, where they silently and efficiently hunted down the few scraps of cowering defenders wherever they were to be found. Groups of flayed ones, attracted by the scent of blood, materialized from their dimension to appear deep within the slums of the city, only to gleefully eviscerate the poor civilian populace in an attempt to quench their eternal hunger. The planetary governor, thinking himself safe within his command bunker, was eventually torn to shreds by a swarm of yep. burrowing scarabs, which seemingly brought a grisly end to the defense of Damnos. Well, and that's the thing, too, is like, other than the actual leaders of the Necrons, there's no negotiating or talking to them or reasoning with them at all. They're just soulless automaton husks that are doing essentially what they're told to do without any feeling remorse whatsoever. So what are you really supposed to do against that other than fight back? You have no real hope. By this point, all hope for the few scattered survivors of Damnos seemed to be lost. But it was here that the Ultramarines finally made their glorious entry. The strike cruiser known as Valin's Revenge stationed itself in orbit above the capital city, sheltering itself from gas pile on fire with the wreckage of the Nobilis. Mm, Three smart. waves of drop pods were launched to the planet's surface as part of their initial offensive push. The first comprised of hundreds of unmanned Deathstorm drop pods which each contained hefty batteries of missiles and heavy weapons, which would rain down salvo after salvo of munitions into the Necron lines which surrounded the capital ruins. The second wave consisted of transportation pods, each of which contained a squad of veteran Astartes who were ready and able to reclaim the world for the Imperium. This wave was led by none other than the company captain Cato Sicarius, 
who, along with his command squad, would lead their forces to locate the enemy lord and eliminate them. The third right. wave similarly consisted of manned pods. However, this one was led by the chief librarian, Varro Tigurius. And he was tasked with landing far deeper into the Necron lines, where his mission was to seek out and destroy the vast gas cannon batteries which had plagued the Imperial defenders during this attack. During this deployment, Chief Librarian Tigurius and his men moved through the living metal tides until they finally encountered none other than the Voidbringer guarding the immense pylons. As the Ultramarines did battle with the Necron forces, Tigurius and the Necron Lord entered into what can only be described as a psychic duel. The unbridled power of the Voidbringer was of a near unmatched level, and he was able to effortlessly force the Librarian to his knees. As baleful arcs of ephemeral energies sparked and bled from his ancient staff, mm. he simply taunted the Ultramarine and insulted him for ever being so foolish as to think that a simple human could... I think I remember this story. I think I've heard the story of this fight between these two at some point in time in another video. ...and insulted him for ever being so foolish as to think that a simple human could match their strength to that of a Necron Lord. This hubris, however, led to his own downfall. Right. With Tigurius on the brink of death, the Ultramarine Sergeant Scopio Vorolanus charged forth to intervene and save his brother. As the Voidbringer continued in his insulting monologue, he did not notice the sprinting Astartes, who fell upon the Lord with the force of a falling angel. With a single strike from his chainsword, he shattered the abyssal resurrection orb and severed the Lord's arm. As the Viridian artifact crumbled, the ancient figure simply fell apart in a haze of metallic dust, with his body unmaking itself and disassembling until there was not even a shadow left in the frigid ice. The Imperial forces closer to the city could see far in the distance an immense flash of emerald light before the shock wave of the explosion hit them, rocking the dust and debris off of their defensive fortifications. This blast acted as the proof that Tigurius and his squad had successfully completed their mission and destroyed the huge artillery pylons. With the skies now safe from heavy particle accelerator fire, the second company were able to deploy even more of their forces to bolster the ragged defenders of Kellenport. At this point, however, it was beginning to feel like somewhat of a futile effort. The city was crumbling, with entire districts having been leveled by the combined offensive fire of the Necrons, as well as by the indiscriminate bombardments of the Imperial forces. You know, I've said it I don't know how many times, but it's like just listening to the description of these battles and uh, the various fights that take place and the fight that just happened between, you know, the Librarian and the Necron, you know, Overlord, whatever. Like, I just want to see this in a TV show. I was even just thinking, you know, right then, like, how cool would it be if they were even to do like, you know, a Clone Wars animated series from the 40K? Like, I would even be happy with that. Like, give me a good Clone Wars, like, animated, you know, style of show for the 40K, but make it a little bit more darker, a little more serious and more adult. Like, I would even be happy with that, man. Like, I just want more, you know, I want more forms of medium for the 40K besides just video games and books. You know what I mean? I want movies and TV shows and series and, and things like that. That's basically Hell's Reach? Okay. Nevertheless, the sons of Gilliman stood resolute against the living metal tide and further bolstered the... Yeah, it's been requested. It's just, it's another one of those things that's like three hours long that I just haven't gotten around to actually sitting down and going through yet. But it is on my list of 40k stuff to watch. Faltering combat fronts wherever they could. It was at this point that the true leader of the Necrons finally revealed himself. 
Gotcha. The scant joy and pride felt at defeating the Voidbringer was replaced by a bitter sense of frustration. For if this Lord was such a challenge to defeat, what hope could be had against his superior? As it turned out, Damnos was not an insignificant world in the eyes of the Necrons during their old days as an empire. And it was in fact a type of planet classed as a crown world. Yikes. As such, the head of the entire dynastic holding had been slumbering beneath the ice, and Rem he was more than prepared to bring a bloody day of reckoning to the foolish humans who intruded upon his territory. Get off my this lawn. leader was a Faeron, known as the Undying, and his resplendent golden frame shone just as starkly against the sea of metal as it had back in the heyday of the Necrons. Now... Maybe I'm maybe I'm misremembering or confusing people, but isn't this the guy who's like basically the only rival to uh, Sarek or Sarkic or, or whatever the guy's name is, who like essentially converted the Necrons from the Necron tier? Like he's the one that made the deal with the Catan to turn them from the Necron tier into the Necrons, how they are now. Like, isn't he the the guy that's like the only one who's like potentially rivaling him for control of the necrons maybe i'm again infusing different characters and and whatnot thankfully however he was soon to contend with captain cato sicarius in a duel which was to decide the fate of stormlord yeah that's who i was thinking this is the captain him. led his most veteran forces out from their drop pods towards a command node of the necron forces where this gleaming Ockroid Lord had surrounded himself with several phalanxes of Lich Guard, Immortals, and the most trusted members of his royal court. A rapid exchange of fire ensued, with bursts of bolt shells blasting through even the thick necrodermis frames of the Lord's bodyguard. The returning arcs of gas fire, however, were more than potent enough to vaporize and tear through even the ancient artificia armor of the company veterans who were to fall gracelessly into the melted ice, much to the dismay of their battle brothers. Eventually, the two commanders entered into their battle together, but even a mighty space marine is an insignificant opponent to an ancient Necron. The Lord toyed with Sicarius parrying and deflecting every swing of his sword with his humming war scythe. All the while, he was slowly and silently making small cuts into the ultramarine, slicing his leg, his arm, and even shattering his helmet so that the mortal could look him yeah. in the eyes one final time. Yeah, I remember hearing about this story before. I remember hearing about this story from something else before. After testing his abilities, the Undying Lord grew tired of these games, and with a single impossibly fast strike, he impaled Sicarius through the heart, lifted his broken body to the skies, and then slammed him into the frigid earth, taking victory over the now shattered captain. The remaining Astartes, upon seeing their commander apparently die before them, rushed forth with an increased sense of fervor and vigor, with their intents now set upon recovering his broken body as well as seeking revenge on this foul, metallic creature. The surviving members of his command squad formed a defensive wall around Sicarius's body, before calling for a Thunderhawk gunship to retrieve them back to an apothecarium. Meanwhile, the venerable dreadnought known as Agrippan had been inspired by the sight of his captain fearlessly charging against the ancient enemy, and so he channeled what rage and fury remained within him and entered the fray as a crashing torrent. His vast mechanical fists bludgeoned dozens of Necrons before he stood towering over the undying Lord, who even in his resplendent glory was unable to endure an assault by a charging dreadnought. Agrippan grabbed the Golden Lord and simply crushed his frame like a frail beetle Damn. before throwing him down into the earth in a burst of brilliant aureate energy. Man said With I can do that too. With the death of their overarching lord, the Necrons reverted to their secondary command protocols, and in unison, they moved into a total retreat. 
With the enemy forces pulling back, the surviving ultramarines were graced with an opportunity to assess their own losses. And it was here that they discovered that their captain Sicarius was not dead, only severely incapacitated, with one of his hearts being completely destroyed by the immense strike of the Necron Lord. Due to his condition, the dreadnought Agrippan took upon himself the mantle of leadership and directed the remaining Astartes to action against the retreating enemy. The Ultramarines advanced for several kilometers, clearing the surrounding areas of Kellenport to bring some relative semblance of safety to the few survivors within the city. But this was not to be the end of their struggle. As Thunderhawk gunships came and went, Captain Sicarius was evacuated back to his strike cruiser for medical attention, and heavier space marine battle tanks were deployed to shore up the defenses of the city, just in case a second Necron attack was still to come. As the marines began to rebuild what few bastions and bunkers they could, Chief Librarian Tigurius had returned from his expedition to destroy the pylons, but he brought with him grave news of the world. He informed his brothers that the entirety of the landscape around the city was simply teeming with Necrons, mm -hmm. who had reformed into fully strengthened phalanxes, and that they were reconverging towards the city for a final offensive operation. Looking at what remained of their forces, the Ultramarines had lost around half of their company numbers, and the surviving Imperial Guardsmen were on the brink of death by exhaustion. There was truly nothing that they could muster to save themselves this day. Such Actual was the retreat. scale of the situation that both Agrippan and Tigurius decided that the planet could not be saved and that a full evacuation was the only recourse they had against these undying legions. But I guess only... Uh, As such, the Imperial can crafts do that, right? began shuttling survivors back to the strike cruiser of Valen's Revenge until only a scant few Imperial forces were left against the coming tide. The remaining Ultramarines fought with such ferocity and such tenacity against the coming darkness that legends are still told of their struggle in the deepest annals of their chapter's history books. Even the guardsmen were roused into a state of glorious bravery at the sight of the sons of Gilliman charging through the rubble-strewn streets, and though their names may be lost to time, their sacrifice shall never be forgotten. Tigurius remained at the front of the battle, sending waves of psychic fury into the Necron ranks, utterly dismantling their metallic frames with but the unbridled power of his mind. Meanwhile, the adamantium giant of Agrippan was seen to channel his thousands of years of battle experience into this conflict as he held the western gate of Kellenport alone for hours, ensuring that his brothers could retreat to the evacuation craft. Eventually, the surviving forces were forced back to the spaceport landing pads at the center of the city, and it appeared that only one final convoy of ships could be sent to save those within the ruins. As such, in this most dire of circumstances, the chief librarian and what few forces could fit were rushed into the final Thunderhawk, where they left 40 marines, 20 guardsmen, and the ancient dreadnought down on the surface Damn. to die. Their sacrifice was to ensure the survival of the chapter's command and the bell of lost... I feel like the, the, the loss of the Agrippan Dreadnought, that's kind of a big deal, too, because obviously you're losing, A, a Dreadnought, but you're also losing thousands of years of that battle experience. I would think he would be um, someone, he, he would be uh, a valuable, you know, person of interest to want to save and bring back up, as opposed to leaving him there to be sacrificed. But perhaps the sacrifice was, was necessary in order to get the people out souls was surely to ring out with their noble deaths As i'm pretty sure he did he did too I, i'm like i said i i've heard some of this battle in another video and i'm pretty sure yeah he he like 
basically ordered everyone to leave and he was he stayed behind on purpose yeah right he's also yeah the heaviest and takes up the most space true as the Thunderhawk departed, those aboard could see that the survivors were quickly overrun, leaving none but Agrippin left standing. Even here in his last moments, he still served the Emperor. With a mighty blast, his reactor core overloaded, releasing an immense explosion which consumed the entirety of the spaceport, bringing thousands of Necrons to damnation with him. Unfortunately, however, with his martyr's death, and with the retreat of the Ultramarines, the world of Damnos was once again to be ruled by the Necrons. Whilst aboard their strike cruiser, the surviving forces began a campaign of orbital bombardments against the Necron tide indeed. upon the planet's surface. Giga Chad, indeed. Any command nodes or power structures were targeted by the vast melter torpedoes, but this operation could not last long. The Imperial ship was forced to withdraw as the Necron presence on Damnos had fully awoken and even more vast artillery pylons were coming yeah. back online, only to target their ship with vast arcs of verdant green energy. Yeah, what's, what's one ship going to do? With the tomb world of Damnos now fully reactivated, it stood as an immense threat against the forces of the Imperium. Somewhere that little squad of Mechanicus guys are like, whoops, sorry. Let us remember that as a crown world, it possessed the largest numbers of Necron forces within its crypts. And so whatever armies it could muster would surely be of a great enough strength to bring a yep. hundred star systems to their knees. And I mean, can you imagine that, dude? Like, you're just a regular, you know, Joe Schmo guardsman, regular person. Assigned on Damnos, it's a, it's a, you know, whatever production planet. There's been no, there, it has no real like strategic value for any other alien, you know, whatever forces to come and attack you. It's kind of a chill outpost, like you know, it's cold there, chill, get it. <laughs> anyway, but it's basically you know an outpost where nothing's really gonna happen, and then all of a sudden. It's a crown world for the Necrons and billions of Necrons get revived and now you're like literally fighting for your lives. Yeah. Any tomb world once awakened is no small obstacle. No shit. And it would take a vast campaign from the Imperial armies to bring it back into submission. Thankfully, however, this was not to be the end yep. of the story of Damnos. The prideful ultramarines would seek to return, to avenge the deaths of their brothers, and to bring justice to the fabled heroes who saved their very lives. I will soon return to tell you of their calamitous and dangerous campaign, where they sought to ultimately eliminate the deathly menace from Damnos once and for all. Well, there we go. There we go. And uh, like you said, this is like part one of a part two, like series video. Um, so we'll definitely do a follow up with the other half uh, and get into the that story of the Ultramines coming back and uh, trying to counterattack and potentially retake the planet of Damnos. But uh, yeah, that was the fall of Damnos 40k lore and story by the scholars lore links below down in the description to the original video without my comment and reaction and to the scholars lore's channel please do me the favor to click those links if you enjoyed this video of his give it go over there and give it a like if you enjoy the man's content please go over there and give him a sub makes a lot of great stuff for the 40k universe um and yeah i mean i already kind of really gave my thoughts about you know the situation again like what really can you do uh when you're <laughs> you know a regular guardsman on uh, some remote world away from everything and it turns out that uh you've been squatting on a, a crown world for the necrons who've been asleep for the last 65 million years and uh yeah some mechanicus uh accidentally hit the wrong button and uh, uh set their alarm off you know they, they didn't hit snooze properly you know kind of a situation so uh, and it turned into, uh, yeah, them uh, losing the world. And like I said, it seems there's going to be a part two for us to get into to uh, 
lengthy about what happens with the uh, Marines trying to retake it. So I'm looking forward to getting into that one. Um, but yeah, so that's going to do it for this one, guys. Um, tune in next time for Lou Barry's vs. Terminators Part 2. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Very well said. Very well said. Um, so yeah, uh, we're doing this reaction live, as you can see from our YouTube members. We'd love to have you guys come in here and join us. Join in the discussions. Uh, give your two cents. Uh, theory crafts, all that kind of stuff that like we like to do and have discussions as we do these reactions live. So if you would like to come in and join us, there is a join button down below, as well as a link in the description to uh, the YouTube membership benefits uh, and tiers that I offer. Check them out, see if any of them have any interest for you. If you'd like to uh, take support from me to the next level and help me out monetarily, doing so obviously allows me to focus on creating YouTube content for you guys on, on a you know continued regular basis. Um, so yeah. We greatly appreciate you do that regardless thank you very much for just taking the time out of your busy days come and hang out and watch the videos if you enjoyed this video consider leaving a like and a sub as it helps me that helps the channel grow and uh yeah hope you're having a wonderful day whenever you're watching this guys thank you very much for doing so we'll see you on the next one